Op zo'n scherm is het Nee. De camera heb je niet opgezet. Uh, die. Uh, die, hè? Ja, die, ja dan is het hier aan deze PC. Dat is als jij hem zo snel neemt, dan heb je hem niet. Nee, maar het gaat er even om. Ik ga het daarop uitleggen. Ja, precies. Die moet in beeld zijn. Dit scherm moet in beeld zijn. Dat bedoel ik. Ja, maar als jij een screen van share staat, dan is het ook een kleine dia's. Ja, maar als je dat ding aanwijst, ja, dan wil ik het zien. Ik wil ik heb het liever daarop gericht als ik dingen op het bord. Ja, dan moet je even kijken op je prestatie van de PC. Op welke computer? Uh, als je het vanaf daar blijft. Uh, ik denk wel dat je het via Zoom van share bent. Of, of jij zegt ik moet hem daar op. Ja, als jij als een als als Zoom zegt share ja, op Twitter, dan gaat deze. Test 1, 2. Test 1, 2. Ik ga even nog een test. Ik ga even zoeken omdat het zo moeilijk niet bij zo'n staat. Hallo. Test 1, 2. Test, test, test. test, test, test. Oké, okay, online te horen. Dan kunnen jullie allemaal je geluid uitzetten. Oké. Okay. So, what I explained last time was um, uh, that if you set up your detection scheme for OCT um, with a spectrometer, that you have this tremendous signal to noise advantage. And, not only can you do it with the spectrometer, but there's also another implementation that's very common now for endoscopy uh, that follows the same recipe, but it's slightly different. So in this case, what you do is you have your, your you have a laser that emits only one wavelength at a time, but it can sweep that wavelength over time, over time. So as a function of time, the output change if you have the standard interferometer proper reference and the sample arm is the photoreceiver. And what you measure now as the photoreceiver is a signal that is a function of time. But since the laser is sweeping its, its wavelength, it's actually a sweeper function of wave vector for K. And then and you have the same amount of information that you do it with the spectrometer, you have your intensity of function of wave number, you do it via a transformer, you get your depth information. So what you've done in that case uh, this should be an animation. Um, okay, there's something that's not responding. Why is that? Uh, there it's going. So you see the sweep. You can um, you see the interference uh, as a function of time, which is a function of wavelength. 
to do your Fourier transform and you get your depth profile. So in this case, you've moved your complexity from your de detection part to your uh, source part. And so the, the challenge now becomes creating these lasers that can rapidly sweep the wavelength and have a narrow instantaneous wavelength. Because the point is you want to measure your interference, let's say, to a depth of three millimeters. That means that the wavelength that comes out of the laser should have a coherence length that is at least that three millimeter, because otherwise it won't be able to measure over that depth. So the formula that I gave you for the coherence length in terms of spectral domain OCT or standard OCT, that that depth range that you want now needs to be the three millimeter, which means you have to have a very narrow laser. And then in practice, the laser output has to be, has to have a bandwidth on the order of 0.1 nanometer. Now, there's been a tremendous advancement in the technology of making these kinds of lasers. So the OCD community has significantly benefited from it. These lasers are actually specifically built for this application. And, and the, the, the most dominant uh, or best implementation is a, is a surface emitting diode where you put a mirror on top, the whole cavity is like a millimeter or so, you vibrate the membrane. That's, uh, that gives you a very, that means you tune the cavity length, which makes sure that the, the wavelength sweeps. And then after that, you have a strong amplifier that, that, that outputs yeah. like a 20 or 40 milliwatts. It, it sweeps because the cavity changes the length, right? yeah. so the resonance changes. Exactly. That's so you know that the wavelength has to match in equal time with right, cavity yeah. length. But if you change the cavity length, you have to change the wavelength. If you do that, uh, I mean, and the thinner the cavity, the narrower that, that line is, is that comes out of the laser. Um, so again, this then an actual measurement when you would do that with, with such a laser. And, um, no, I'm not going into details. We in the in the beginning of this century we built these lasers ourselves. Now we just buy them. Uh, okay, also this one. And what can you do with it? Uh, so mainly endoscopy. And um, why this shift to these sweat lasers? Uh, I told you about the application of homology. There you use uh, an illumination of 850 nanometers. That's because the water is very transparent for that wavelength. It goes through about the two and a half centimeters of water to reach the back of the eye. So 850 is excellent for that. But if you want to go to tissue, uh, tissue scatters and the longer wavelength penetrates deeper. So you would like to have a, if you want to go uh, in endoscopy, you would like to penetrate a little further. So you would like to go, for instance, to 1300 nanometers. So 1300 nanometers as again a window in terms of the water absorption. Water absorption is relatively low, so you get a good depth penetration. The problem is that uh, detectors for 1300 nanometers, building spectrometers at 1300 nanometers is difficult because the, the devices that you use for that, that's indium gallium arsenide, it's not CMOS anymore. They are noisier, it's harder to make them uh, at certain performance specs. And so and, and make them big and it didn't really exist because it's far in the infrared and so why would you develop a sensor for that when you kind of have to go with a sensor for their camera that's visible so, okay so that's why basically that that there was that push towards the sweat laser concept for 1300 nanometers so that's now the dominant implementation for endoscopy um let me see Uh, this is still with an, an old implementation, but the only thing I want to point out is that we're looking at the esophagus of a swine here, of, of a pig, basically, and this is what we typically see in OCT, that is this layered structure of uh, the lumen. So lumens are in general very nicely organized with layered structures, and as soon as that layer structure is disturbed, that means that there's something wrong. So that's how you that's how you use the structural information from OCT. Um, I'm going to skip this because I showed you already the lung. I'm not going to show you the this you have already seen. I want to move now to um, visualizing blood flow. And so when you do a depth scan of the tissue, basically what you acquire is uh, is an interferogram. And this is this is when you would move a mirror, this is what you would see in the pierce pattern as a function of the movement of the mirror. 
So you can imagine that you do that at one location, you repeat it after a time. Tau is exactly the same location. And then you can measure an interference pattern that is slightly shifted. If you just look at the position of the envelope, which is what we normally do to determine the position, you see that the envelopes of these two functions basically overlap. There's a very tiny difference between them. So it's very difficult to, difficult for the envelope to determine the difference between these two scans. But the interesting thing is that we have this interference pattern underneath. And you can look at the phase of this interference pattern and compare the phase of these two scans and realize that if you go from a maximum to a minimum in your interference, it's a motion of about the wavelength to your sample arm. A half a wavelength motion of a, of a scattering object creates a full wave pattern difference in the two pi phase difference. So that phase is very sensitive to very small motion. And we can measure that phase difference between these two, two profiles. And actually, if you take the phase difference and divide by the time delay between these two scans, delta by the delta t, you get something that has the dimension of a, a frequency shift. And you can go through all the calculations, but this determines it to be exactly the Doppler shift that you expect for a moving particle. So we can convert these phase shifts, shift, phase shifts into frequency shifts or in Doppler shifts. So the uh, what is now key here for this uh, for this uh, Doppler shift or this phase shift? So the phase shift is proportional. To the time difference between the measurements. If you wait longer, the particle will move further. And so the phase shift will be larger. It depends on the flow of the particle. So if the flow is larger, the phase shift will be larger. It, it depends on the refractive index and factor of uh, four pi. And you divide it by the wavelength with which you measure. Because if the wavelength is longer, then you need to move a larger distance to acquire a certain phase shift. Um, and then there is this cosine term. And the cosine term is uh, comes from the angle between your, your, your incident beam and your flow, flowing particle. You can imagine if this is your incident beam, this is your particle moving, but if your marked particle moves from here to here, there's no pathway change. So there won't be a phase change. And so you need you need a component of the flow that is along the direction of the beam, and that's expressed by this cosine theta, where you know uh, the theta is the angle to your incoming beam and your flow. And if that angle is 90 degrees, then the cosine is zero. There's no phase shift. Uh, it's that angle that makes it very difficult to do quantitative flow for the direct one if you don't know the exact angle of your blood vessel. You can measure Doppler shift, but you can't convert to a real flow. Um, so, with the thinking for a bit about the phase shift, because um, ideally, when you talk about phase shifts, you want to compare two identical signals. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the signals have been shifted somewhat, right? The frequencies are slightly, slightly different um, because of the Doppler shift, I presume. You mean here? Yeah, because uh, on this slide, I was actually thinking like, wait, the blood flow is is uh, moving at an orthogonal angle, as in not uh, like parallel. Yeah. So right. So how would you get the phase um, to change? Yeah, to change basically, uh, barring Doppler effects. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but the the, the Doppler -ish effect, uh, you know, it's a little bit confusing because in ultrasound, it's really the shift of the frequency, and so you. You, you have your sound wave that reflects from a moving object. And if you would analyze the frequency, you truly see the shift, you right. hear the shift in the frequency. Right. Okay. So it, it's hard to believe, but it's the same thing for light. So if you if that light bounces off a moving object, the color changes slightly. Only the problem is now you're at the terahertz of so frequencies, and then you induce a, a one kilohertz shift on it, and, and then you go and look at the change in the wavelength. You know, hard to figure out. So, but when I when I show you this picture, I do one measurement and then I delay and do my second measurement. I can very intuitively explain to you that there will be a phase shift between these two signals because of the motion. 
Oh, you have a hard time already with the patient. Yeah, as in, uh, I'm really thinking about the so like how this would work in practice. Does it? You can, this is like right, I can start with your object and then you move the object, you measure the measurement and then you move the object by 10 and Right, but if we're um, measuring in a perpendicular angle, then it would go from like this to this. So what, what's your beam? Your beam starts on the top, okay? And, and how's your particle moving? Yeah, yeah. perfect. Yeah. That's the point is then that there is no shift. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there, then you won't measure a shift. Yes, right. And I also confused because the picture I thought, wait, they're actually moving perpendicular to each other. So you couldn't see, or yeah, not quite perpendicular, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But just about. And so it is correct that if they are per perfectly perpendicular, there's only a doctor shift, no shift. Right. If the, if no, even if the if the if the move motion is perpendicular to the beam, even with the sound wave, there is no doctor. If your object, if your sound wave bounces off an object that's moving like this, there won't be a frequency shift. It's only the component along the beam that will change that will create this for the oh, wait, yeah, the doctor shift. Yes. I will show you later a method to actually do measure the collateral flow, how it can be done. But it relies on a different mechanism. Um, so the, uh, the idea is that you have your OCT signal, you measure um, a little bit later, there's a phase shift between them and all and these phase shifts you turn into, uh, into uh, uh, velocities if you know the, the uh, angle of the light. And so this is now uh, the inner product of the inflowing k-factor and the reflected k-factor in their opposite, in opposite directions. That's the reflected light that you need to capture. Uh, uh, product, inner product with the velocity factor. And this is the formula that was done that I showed previously with the cosine factor. And then you, your 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 frequency is defined by uh, this expression here with the cosine now, and then the you can calculate uh, the, the 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 frequency shift based on the phase shift and the and the uh, delay between them. Okay, so this is now an example of uh, such a measurement. And so on the top you see your structural OTT image, and in the bottom you can see. Uh, what happens when you take two A lines that are basically acquired with nearly the same, well, there's sequential A lines and next to one another, but it's also slightly displacement because it's so small, so much beam overlap. And you just analyze the phase difference and you can see your two velocities in opposite directions. They're color coded in, uh, in black for one shift in one direction and white for the other direction. And you can even see a very tiny uh, capillary somewhere here and this is a movie so it should play Let's see if it does doesn't oh i have movies later don't worry uh, so this was a verification of that experiment remember that i explained about the indocyanin green or the fluorescence that you could inject in your bloodstream and then you can determine what's an artery and a vein okay so based on that uh, time sequence huh? so this is the Short time delay, and the arteries light up, and then when you wait, you go both arteries and veins light up. So now you can determine which one of these two is an artery and a vein. And we can do a measurement along uh, these two locations. I think I'm only showing one of them, but the nice thing is that very close together an artery and a vein, so you can look at the flow in these two, uh, two uh, um, locations. It is position two, huh? so it says two. It's this one actually. We're looking here. So on the left, the structural image. On the right, uh, the calculated Doppler shifts, and then uh, we made an integration of the shifts over the circles, and that is plotted here at the bottom. And so here in red, you see the, the artery. And this is a nice heartbeat. And the interesting thing of this measurement is that also in the day, we expect actually that there's no heartbeat anymore. You still see a little remnant of, 
and, and what's the idea by that you see the entire country in one veins is because um, uh, you get the, the, the capillary network and all the blood vessels is in, is in elastic uh, uh, set of tubes so you decrease the pressure and when it travels further and further that basically the, the pressure wave is dampened out by the flexibility of the network but still uh, if you don't look in the eye and the eye is a very nice system because the supply is coming into the optic nerve and leaving through the optic nerve, so it's kind of a closed system. You see that uh, that uh, uh, that in the eye, if you look at the veins, that there's still a little bit of pulsatility left from uh, uh, from the heartbeat. So, at what angle are we watching the eye and trying to make it right? So, blood is flowing in and out of the screen currently. Yes, more or less. Huh? So yeah. we, we assume that uh, the angle that the beam makes with blood vessels in the eye is between 90 and, and 85 degrees. So it's nearly perpendicular to the beam. And that makes it very hard to quantify if you don't know the angle. So quantification is a, 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 of blood flow is a very difficult problem. Still unsolved, I would say. That's this project. Hmm? Slightly more than that, actually. <laughs> oh, man. And this is then a, um, uh, an example. If you do a larger scan, what you can visualize in terms of the, the larger blood vessels that are present in the retina. So here, this is a scan of toward, towards the optic nerve head. So here, the, this is the bit of the optic nerve head. That's where all the blood vessels come in and go out. And you see this really High flow of also in the eye. So we're widening the like those are just things and yeah, funny. yeah. And I'm not sure it's it's not that always white is a pain and black is an artery. It really depends on uh, um, the direction of the flow and yeah. Um. So then we get to the minimum detected the detectable flow velocity. And that is related to the to the variance in the phase that we measure. So if you have a perfect stable object, you can measure that repeatedly, and then you should measure the identical phase. But it allows you also to determine the noise on the phase. So given a certain noise on the phase, what is then the minimum velocity that you can measure uh, based on that uh, on that noise? So the uh, this is an expression for the for the phase shift based on a certain velocity, and we can rewrite that where we want to know what the velocity is of the function now of the noise on the phase. Um, so these are then typical numbers. Um, if you if you use a light source that has a thousand and forty nanometer wavelength. The time delay between subsequent measurements is 10 microseconds. So that means we're looking at the system that has a repeat scan of uh, 100 kilohertz. Uh, we have a refractive index. We, name, we take an angle between 85 and 89 degrees. Then the minimum velocity that we get is 22 to 110 millimeters per second. And that is really high. So basically, that is too high to be practical in the eye. And you have these kinds of flow velocities only in the, in the bigger arteries. So if you want to measure the really small capillaries, this, this, this won't work. So what you can do now is you can change the time interval. So we can go from a time interval between two a less of 0 0.01 seconds to let's say 0.64 uh, milliseconds or 1.25 or two and a half milliseconds. So we, we are going to increase the time delay between subsequent measurements. And if we, well, we can also measure the phase noise uh, because it's expected that the phase noise will increase if, if we increase the time delay between two measurements. We can see that it actually does go up, but not as rapidly as your time delay. So if you then look at the formula that we have for what is the minimum detectable flow, you still gain. So here, um, uh, oh, there, there is not yet. Oh, yeah. No, this is the flow velocity. So here we get 17 to 89 millimeters per second. Here we already go to 0.4 to 2 millimeters per second. 
from 24 to 1.2, 0.13 to 0.6 millimeters per second, and so on. So here, here already, we have the at low velocity, lower millimeter per second. And then if you compare that with, let's say, what are relevant velocities, central retinal arteries and veins, and I can say that you're doing uh, 17 to 190 millimeters per second, if you then go to the, the corneal capillaries, that is, uh, these are the blood vessels that are basically diameter of 10 micron, where the red blood cells propagate stack through the red velocities of 0.3 to 3.6 uh, millimeters per second. So you adapt the timings as well, depending on the expected velocity range? Yes, that's what you're going to do. Yeah. Um, well, this is so basically we're going to go for I think the two and a half to five million. I think the two and a half millimeter milliseconds delay is the is the one that really works well. So how do you do that? You have to devise a new scan mechanism where you basically you scan a portion, you jump back, scan it again, and then the rescan should be let's say two and a half milliseconds later. Then you continue to scan. You jump back and rescan that area to, that is exactly 2.5 milliseconds later. So it's we call the back back stitching. So you're basically you move, you jump back, move forward, jump back, like a like it looks like what you do with the sewing machine. Yes, yeah. stitching. Yeah. So and you can do that. This is the motion, and then uh, then you can do and try and measure the retinal vasculature. So this is a Doppler image of the retina, which is done with uh, just doing one scan with the 10 microseconds delay between where you only could see the really high velocity areas. And yeah, you see that, that only around the optic nerve that you see, you see the Doppler system, all the other structures are obscured. And this is that this image is from 2012, so 10 years ago. Yeah. What has the problem? Well, to, we go to this image of 2012. That's it's the better way right? that we made. Then. <laughs> so this is two and a half milliseconds. But you, you see a huge difference. Huh? But especially, uh, and this is still, a bit, I think there's, there's even a better one. But you see here, you're basically looking at the individual capillaries. This is the avascular zone of your fovea. And you, and you can nearly follow the full tree of, let's say, you know, a blood vessel coming in like this, going all the way here, branching out to these capillaries, possibly the oxygen in the tissue being collected back here and then going back. Or the other way around, I don't know, right? But it's like, you can, you can see the full vasculature of the retina. Uh, this is an, uh, this is then even an, a better set when you when you do that eight times and then you average these eight sets and then this is the kind of detail that you can see for the avascular zone. And I think this is then the the high res uh, version of the. Uh, if you look carefully, you can see that there are stitched together areas of one, two, or should be four by or six by four. All right, yeah, you can see four by. It's six by eight. Well, it's it's stitched together, but then it gives you a full full view of the vasculature of the retina. This is this has made it to commercial systems. So, uh, if you go and have an uh, it's called now an OCT angio angiogram or angiography, uh, this is the kind of uh, method they they use to make these kinds of pictures of the vasculature of the retina. But still, it's a uh, qualitative image. There's nothing quantitative about it. You cannot, ex you cannot exert the velocities. That's, yeah, we'll get to that, but that's really a challenge. Is it a problem that the eye, I mean, this, this scale is so small, like the slight movement of the eye into the measurement, I presume? Um, it doesn't go like a self-measurement state. No, it, it does. Huh? In the in the, in this stitching, you can see there's a discontinuity here. Right, these blood vessels should be here. This one should be here. So the time delay between the, the areas that were scanned uh, uh, creates a problem. Um, the 
motion artifacts of the retina also are a problem. So if the, if the patient moves during the data acquisition, you basically have to throw away that data. There are two solutions. One is you build a tracker where, the, where you track the eye motion, but that is not done in the commercial systems. Uh, or uh, you have an algorithm that detects if there's too much motion and you just throw it away. Uh, you can imagine that uh, uh, you can do these air, large area scans. They take maybe you know 12 seconds. It's easy to have somebody behind the system for one or two minutes and just take a lot of scans and then you select out the good ones and you can still build an endocrine. But if somebody has really uh, jittery eye motion, it won't work. So you need to reasonably stable. Okay, now I want to get to something um, that we're going to use for another method to do flow detection. And uh, that is laser speckle. And uh, have you heard about laser speckle? You know what it is. Yeah. Okay, so that when I show you this, you understand what you measure in your observation point. Out. So the key here is just laser light. A monochromatic light source, flat waveform that hits the surface, and has a roughness that is more than the wavelength of the light. And then you have here an observer, and an observer observes all these electromagnetic waves that come from different points here on this uh, on this surface. And what is then the electrical field that this observer sees? Yeah, you can look at the Check your notes. Yeah, we were just checking some stuff about speckle when you were like, okay. sorry, but what was the question? Oh, okay. No, no, I'm the home. So let me tell tell me if it disconnects with what the deer told you or, or where the explanation differed. But you have your point here, your observation point, and what you see in that point is a deep field, but it's a sum of all these different fields from the from this surface. And the problem is that each field that arrives at the detector has a random but different phase. I'm not sure what is my next slide. Oh, yeah. okay. And so when you when you would measure the intensity that that, that observer sees as a function of data, and with data I now mean that I can move my observation point around the object and it would make an angular change. And when I do my angular change, all these paths will change in length. And so all these spaces will change. That means you will lose spectral pattern. The other way of changing the intensity that I see is by changing the wavelength of the line. Because the, the, the phase that arrives here is the path length divided by the wavelength. So if I change the wavelength, then all these phases will change. And so I can measure uh, this pattern, this intensity, as a function of the angle or as a function of wavelength. And then this is the kind of fluctuations that you see. And what is now very special about this speckle is that uh, it has a very high noise, but it also has a very interesting distribution. Oh, and I haven't, don't have the distribution, so I'm going to go. Did you show the distribution of speckle? Yes, you did. Oh, it's a negative exponential, so I don't have to show it. And now I think like the contrast to the bigger thing with the variant technologies. Okay. Am I visible in the video? Um, yeah. Okay, so the interesting thing is that I can write here the probability to measure the intensity I versus the intensity I versus the mean intensity. So the probability to measure certain intensity versus the mean intensity at this point. And that the distribution is a negative exponential. So it means I have very high probability to measure very low intensity. And I have a very small probability to measure very high intensity. And so this is but you also see in this uh, in this graph here, you have a very high likelihood of measuring really low intensities. They happen a lot, but these high ones are really rare. So negative exponential distribution, once you know the probability distribution can go to that of like variance and other statistics. 
I'm relying on you now. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, how does the filter uh, that shapes the expectation write down e is e1 plus e2 plus e2? I just do three fields that, that, that come to my detector. I can already calculate the intensity, the intensity of the filter has e1, e1 star. Yes, e1. Two star plus e one e three star plus e two e one star plus e two e two star plus e two e three star plus so yeah so we get it but this one e one with e one star one star here we cancel the phase because it's the number with this complex volume. So this is just an example. This one is an intensity with an E i delta phi, where that, that is the phase difference between one and two. And this one is an intensity, uh, this is intensity one three, E i delta phi one three. And so on. And so what I get for the intensity is basically intensity one plus intensity two plus intensity three plus a term actually plus uh, two i one two cosine delta phi one two plus uh, two i one three cosine delta phi one three plus and so on. So I get a constant term plus each fluctuating cosine term that are completely random. And this is generating this this, this wildly fluctuating signal here. Okay, another way of looking at this problem. This complicated calculation, but I often can say my intensity I can determine from the sum of the fields in a complex plane because all these numbers e1 is a complex number, e2 is a complex number, and so on. So I can also draw complex planes and say, okay, this is my vector e1. So it has a certain amplitude, that's the length, and it has a certain phase given by the angle. And now I get my second field, uh, my, e, my field E2, and I can just put it on top of it. This is my field E2. And my field E3. So I make it a vector sum. And this kind of just becomes Brownian motion sort of thing. That's one way of then explaining the kind of intensities that you get uh, by saying, okay, what is now my final field? My final field is the sum of all these fields. And I can I can model this field as a random ball through a complex plane, right? And that, that means that this E field is one step in my random walker, and this one is my next step in my random walker, and this is my third step in my random walker. But the idea is that I want to convey that you can get the total field as a sum vector sum of these individual fields. And then when I have this final field, I can calculate. The intensity from it, but I can also, can also calculate the phase of this final field, and the amplitude and phase of this, this final field. So I'm really calculating now E, sorry, not E1, sorry, E. Okay, so this brings me to another method of doing Doppler. And the idea is as follows I have a collection of particles, point scatterers that move through a volume. And in red is indicated what the volume is that I can measure with my OCT. So in the transverse direction, it's my focus. And in the longitudinal direction, it's the coherence. Yeah, am I, are they complaining online? No, but I think that it's- There is not even, there's nobody. No, but it is, it's my second. 
Okay. Um, so this now, yeah, the coherence length in that defines this parameter and the, the, the conformal function of the waves of my beam defines it in this in this direction. So this is my measurement point. So my in my OTB signal, right, the field that comes back from my sample that I mix with my reference arm, the field is the sum of all the fields coming back from these individual particles. Okay, so I like with the speckle, I get a field coming back from my volume. And that field is a sum, a vector sum of all these hundreds of particles that are in my volume. Okay, so what is going to happen now if, my, if I move that collection of particles, if I translate it to my volume? I, I don't translate it much. Huh? Let's say, I, yeah, I, I translate over this distance. So this whole collection of particles is going to move at this much. And it's perfectly perpendicular <laughs> right, uh, for this distance, okay? So now I have my, this particle, it scatters back a certain field, right? If I move it to over here, what will change in the field that the particle scatters back? So like the angle starts to change? No, it doesn't. If you remember, oh. it travels perfectly perpendicular to the beam. Parallel. Mm -hmm. the parallel. Is parallel. All right. Yeah, the motion is parallel. Yes. There's no grounding motion. They don't move among themselves. It's a There's static some structure of scatter. Hmm? There's some There's no. For what? I don't know. I'm it's perfect. Yeah, wait, okay, so oh, like this. Oh. Wait, but we are, let's see, what, what are we investigating? We are trying to add all the vectors and then- we... No, no, all I'm asking you is what happens if only, only one vector in um, X, let, let X is uh, 108. So the 108 particle in this collection, <laughs> and I have this field coming back, and this is that particle right there. And I move it a tiny bit. What will change, or if or not will change because all the volume. Yeah, I feel like it's, it's a very small. And you can just neglect it, but um, yeah, okay, let's neglect it. But let's say we're now at the edge here. What you may have to keep in mind is the intensity profile of the beam. So this is now X. This is the intensity profile. Right? Yeah, that's going to shift. Right? So, and which, what part is that? What's going to shift that? What is going to change in the sector in X, number yeah. 110? That now, because <laughs> it's at the edge. The, because, uh, I'm tempted to say the intensity, but nearly. Yeah, it's so density, of course. Yeah, the field, field is density. Right. right. So the amplitude might change, but the phase is going to remain the same. Right? Well, that's the assumption because it's perpendicular. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then the other thing is what happens with the particle, and I kind of drew hard boundaries with the particle that before the measurement is inside the sphere and after is outside the sphere. What? So what was the it's sphere cool. again? The sphere is defined, well, it doesn't have these hard boundaries, but it's it's defined by the focusing of the beam. So the beam is focused, that gives you the dimensions in X and Y. And then in the Z direction, the, the sphere is determined by the coherence length of the source, which is the depth resolution that you have. Well, it, it, it's taken into account when it wasn't taken into, into account before. Uh, there, yeah, that's one option. So it wasn't there before, and then it moves into the volume, and it so is a new field that contributes. Yeah. Right. Or it was there and it moves out. Right. So in your in your sum of let's say uh, a thousand uh, fields, mm -hmm. you have to take out one vector because it's gone. Mm -hmm. So that's going to change the final outcome. 
And if you if you bring one in, you have to add a new one, which is going to change the final outcome. So this, now I think you will understand that this vector is going to change. Mm -hmm. I have a nice animation because we animated this. So here you see your volume flowing through the measurement volume. Huh? And for every particle inside the volume, we uh, calculate an amplitude and a phase, sum all that up. And then here in this plane, you see that final vector walking through my complex plane. Still yeah. like another rainbow. Yeah, it looks like a rainbow. Absolutely. But it also reflects something about the flow flow. If you don't believe me, yeah, I just it's like the change would be, be more dramatic if it flows faster. Yes, of course. Yes. And so that is my second animation where we move a little faster. Right. Yeah. It's, it's... And so you know now that that we can that that hard part and the transversal flow in the retina, for instance, can be quantified by looking at how this phase are changes. And now you need to come up with math to quantify that. And if you want, I can show you. Still <laughs> So when we add all these paths, are we, this might be completely wrong. So I'm sorry, no, no, Brian, no. but are we measuring vectors from the origin to all the points and then adding them up? Um, say that again. Right, so these are all uh, points in, in space. Yeah. And then these are all the separate vectors, right? And the vector fields, uh, E1, E2, whatever. No, As not in, in this graph. This graph shows yeah, right, yeah, the, the graph the right is the total. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah. But that is um aggravated from all the individual yeah. vectors coming from the left. Yeah, That's yeah, it, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So the vectors on the left, how are we measuring those? Is it from the origin of the thing on the left to like every point? I think that's we, we, we measure so what we need from this particular point is a, is a field amplitude and a phase. Mm -hmm. So the field amplitude we say it's a point scatter, so it's isotropic, so that makes the amplitude part easy, maybe it's the intensity of the infalling beam or the heat field of the infalling beam at this location. That is the amplitude that comes back. And then, and then the phase for this particular location is given by the actual distance that it travels back and forth from a certain plane towards here and back. Ah, yeah. So I've somewhere defined the plane here. So I know then what the phase is of this particle that comes back relative, all that matters is about relative phase, to a particle that's slightly deeper that travels a little more back and forth. So I need my Gaussian income B that goes into this simulation to determine the amplitude of the electrical field at each of these locations. And that I found as the, as the amplitude of the, of the individual fields for my total sum. I see. Yeah, and now it makes sense why the phase doesn't change because it's just a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what I, I can introduce also uh this this component uh because then uh it depends on the angle of the flow you can work it in and you can also then work it out again so get rid of it um so what i do is i'm gonna i have two consecutive measurements because i need to detect it from the, the, the change in that e field right so i have one field e1 that is now the total sum huh? of the individual particle in one total sum. E1 is in amplitude one and E I phi one. And the second measurement is E2 uh, defined by an amplitude and a phase. Okay, and I can do different things to quantify what happens to these signals. So, so I can take the conjugate product. So I can take the product of these two E times E1, E2 times E1 complex and get A2, A1, E I phi two minus phi one. Or you could take the ratio of these two, that's A2 divided by A1, and I get also a difference between these uh, 
to uh, fields. So, uh, so we chose for this approach ratio pairs because the nice thing is that the actual amplitude of the field drops out. And so if you would increase the illumination, then A2 and A1 would both increase and, and so on. But if you take the ratio, you kind of normalize out the uniform uh, incident intensity and you still get the same you know, difference. So you have now have these ratios. You can, you can characterize it by a Q, which is a ratio and a phi, which is the phase difference between the two. And now the magic is, oh, is the magic already here? No. Uh, okay, we did this already, showed that. So the the key part is then that you have these the intensity profile, these particles uh, flowing in and out. And so what is important is basically the overlap of the volume between measurement one and measurement two. That the overlap is perfect, so if you make it static, you measure the same volume twice, there won't be any change. But uh, if there's a motion, you get these particles moving in and out. And so you calculate the overlap integral, which is defined by the, 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 the lateral change, delta x, over the B waves. That's an important term again. And, and the depth change in this direction over the coherence line. That is kind of the volume. And this is the difference in the volume that you get if you move a little bit. Then you have this, this phase shift or this Doppler shift that I talked about before, that one has to flow parallel to your uh, incoming beam that gives you a phase change of two times uh, center wavelength times delta C22 is because you travel back and forth. So now I've included also the lateral flow component, the phase shift with the lateral flow component. And then, so uh, this. Alpha here is already the end result of having integrated, uh, of calculating the overlap integral. The, exactly. The and it is, is some sort of characteristic number, I guess. Yes. It's basically right? you, have to, you, you have to define three e your 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 detection volume defined by you know the coherence length because that's the decay of your signal, and then in the lateral direction it's a little easier to understand it's your Gaussian beam profile. And now I move my whole volume, and then I'm going to calculate what the overlap is between uh, these two volumes. And and if it's, there's zero flow, then delta x and delta z are zero, then alpha is one. And if I have a certain motion, then my overlap of these two volumes will decrease. And in the simplest form is that you say it's a block, but in reality, it's not a block, it's defined by Gaussian details, defined by volume by Gaussian. Yeah, because the, the e to the power minus x squared is sort of Gaussian basically, right? And then we have got that into the dimension, I guess. And yes. And well, this I have my motion defined now only along the x direction and the z direction. Right. If I would also have my y direction into it, then I would get the x squared plus the y squared divided by omega zero squared, and then the, this one is separate because this is defined by the point. Yeah, as an analysis, thinking about this, of like it's uh, Gaussian, uh, just just by heart, but thinking like this is the e to the minus uh, x squared that is. Sort of the Gaussian way of it. I mean, well, if I could say it's like this so in one dimension is the Gaussian overlap yeah. between the Gaussian. What's the overlap between these two functions? And now in, in two and three dimensions. Yeah, right. But then if you plot alpha, it's also, yeah, sort of Gaussian ish. Alpha is kind of Gaussian ish, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then I think that you could plot it in two dimensions with one, like, or three, I guess. So the y axis or going up would be alpha, and then you've got x and z axis, and you sort of get a two dimensional Gaussian that you go along. So, anyways, then never mind. Okay, well, let me, let me then stick to this one. This is then your velocity, huh? delta x squared plus delta z squared squared is divided by t, that's your velocity. This is your overlap integral, and then you can uh, uh, parameterize the whole thing by 
in I theta, I theta is this part and minus beta squared is this part and that, that beta is now a relative displacement. And then the magic comes in that is that you can actually calculate the probability density uh, of this uh, of these, these phasor pairs. And I won't show them to the bottom, but you can find now the probability that has a certain Q and a certain phase is given by this expression here. So now you have the probability distribution of, you have two phasor pairs with a certain amount of, of uh, Velocity, yeah, because the velocity is in beta, so that defines alpha, and alpha is in this, this equation. So, given a certain velocity, I get I can plot the probability distribution of the, of the ratios of these phases that I don't measure. Now, probability distributions are extremely powerful because what it allows you to do is say, okay, I do 10 measurements or I do 100 measurements, I have this distribution of measurements. But which distribution fits best, best to that? So then I'm going to fit these distributions to my measurements and I find out which one is the best fit. It's called the maximum likelihood. And that gives you, if you find the probability, you get your alpha, you get your beta, you get your relative displacement, you get your velocity. Uh, this so, uh, let's see. So if we're fitting, we are trying to. For a moment, I was thinking we are fitting q and phi. So we're looking for values of q and phi which make it fit. Um, but that might be wrong. Uh, no, what we we do have is we have a set of ratios a one and a two. We have a set of measurements e one and e two. And for that set, I can always calculate the ratio, mm -hmm. which gives me a uh, Q and a five. Ah, yes, yes. So I have my incidence of Q right. and five, Q and five. That's a whole collection. Okay. And now I and now I need to know what is the underlying this uh, probability. Okay. So then you can get alpha. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So you need 10, 20, 100. That's important. And how many do you need? Because it tells you how many times you need to repeat. And then these are uh, examples of, uh, as a function, what the probability distributions look like with certain values of beta. And beta, uh, small means little flow, and beta, large means a lot of flow. And then if you look at the distribution of the phase, it's therefore slow flow, you can see it's really big around the phase difference of zero. And it grows out for higher velocities. And here you look at the ratio of A2 divided by A1. Again, uh, when uh, the flow is low, we expect that ratio to be close to one. But when the flow increases, that, that the ratio between these two becomes more and more different. Um, now, and then we went into you know, what are now realistic values. Uh, and this is now the most interesting graph that uh, you can choose uh, different time delays between these measurements. And then for one millisecond time delay, you can measure velocity between one and 10 millimeters per second. If you decrease the time delay to uh, 100 microseconds, you can measure velocity between 10 and 100 millimeters per second, and so on. Right. And so, um, the, the, the second question is, what is the relative error on measuring this flow? How many measurements do you need and what's then the error? So the assumption here is that we do 25 measurements. So that we measure 25 phasor pairs. In practice, that means 26 measurements because we can compare one to two or two to three and so on. So, and then uh, do I have that distribution? Uh, oh, I don't have it. Um, I have it in my next slide. Anyway, so what I can do now is I can, from I have this 25 measurements and I can fit the best likelihood. But also from the best likelihood fit, I can determine my accuracy. You know, if I change 
the probability is if I change my beta a little bit, will it still fit nice? You know, if it's a if it's if the air if it still fits nicely for large changes in data beta, then I have a large relative area on my measure. And I can do that for the individual components. I could say, well, I only look at the amplitude ratio. How accurate am I? I can only look at the phase. How accurate am I? I can look at the full complex signal and how accurate am I? And then this shows me that the blue one is only amplitude. And you see that your error really explodes. And if you can go to your next delay, or small again, but then it explodes again. And I have to realize this is the most dominant method of quantifying flow because there was this assumption that the amplitude, the decorrelation of the amplitude was slower than the decorrelation of the phase. It was assumed, well, the phase here correlates faster. So we want to measure over a larger velocity range. So you need to take the amplitude. And this shows you it's not true. The, the, the amplitude is the worst thing to choose if you want to do flow. The better thing is to do phase. But the best, of course, is the complex, it's the whole thing. You combine the information, but it also tells you now what is the contribution of the amplitude to the precision that you achieve with phase. And then it also shows you that if you then go for a scheme like this, nobody has done it, but this is a prediction that if you use these intervals, you can get a nice, nearly linear response. Uh, over uh, two decades for flow velocity. I noticed that phase based, based methods actually go down in red uh, error. Yeah. Is that probably because the velocity at one point sort of better matches the um, delay between measurements? So the phase actually starts to. Uh, uh, it's a good question. I'm not 100% sure. Um, It's when then you have phase shifts of phi, you get the biggest change in, in your phase. Uh, it might be related to that because this is also a logarithmic scale, and so uh, it could be it could be have the shape on a linear scale. It might have the shape of a of a, of a cosine. You see where where it drops when you have the uh, the large phase shift, and at some point. It becomes too large again, and then phases start to wrap and it becomes in certain in uncertainty increases. And never look at it in that detail. Okay. And uh, where does it come from? I hope I can still explain this one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and but it's the expect it's the, uh, the logarithm of the probability density function. So this is why you need the probability density function. You have an exact probability density function. You can calculate the logarithm given derivative to a, which was that overlap integral that gives you an expectation value and that gives you the gamma and the lower bound and that gives you the best kind of. Uh, uh, the best measurement that's the theoretical lower limit for the standard deviation. Thanks for the slides. If you say so, <laughs> if I say, so, yeah. yeah, and then and then get the maximum likelihood estimator. But anyway, so here what we plot now is the relative displacement data. So this is basically the velocity, and then along this axis we have to we plotted not the, the measured velocity but the standard deviation. So here you see. The error that occurs, right? And then in blue, that was that amplitude based error. In red, it's the phase based error. And in black, it's the it's the uh, complex, the full complex maximum likelihood estimate. And I you say, okay, on this graph, it just creeps up. And on the other one, it was flat. On the other one, I plotted this error divided by the velocity. Because then it's a relative error with respect to the velocity, and then it becomes this this uh, this nearly flat line. Uh, 
Okay, well, I went much further into Doppler than I wanted to, but uh, you know, it's, I think it's nice to show how, how you can do these calculations and then actually do measurements that, uh, that uh, try and fit. So, I mean, if you ask me where are we now, that is, can we do this? And that's, we haven't done. It's kind of a challenge to do all these different properties and then, uh, Okay, I tell you what we're doing. The, the model is for point scatterers, but we want to do it for, for, for blood. And so a blood is not a point scatter. So we're going to flow blood now to small capillary and verify the view. See if it deviates. And if it does, how can we fix that? <laughs> hmm? Another master's degree. Yeah, or nearly PhD, but. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> But sure, if you are interested, you have many, many master projects. <laughs> okay, let's go to uh, to light polarization because that's another interesting aspect. So light's a transverse wave. Uh, it oscillates perpendicular to the propagation direction. And um, in contrast to sound, sound is a longitudinal wave. It doesn't have a, a, a polarization state light does. And so we can actually use that. Huh? We can uh, ex exploit the polarization state of light even in our tissue measurements. So who's the potato? Bibian and Jaeger. I said uh, it, she, she, was, she didn't find the zoom, but then now she was. Okay. Uh, okay, so then we can have uh, uh, oscillation along the y direction. We can have an oscillation along the x direction, but uh, we can also have an oscillation simultaneous along x and y. Do you know what polarization state this would be? Y circular. If I take the vector sum of the x and y component right here and done like 45 here, which is diagonal, I guess. Yeah, exactly. 45 degrees in a plane, oscillating nicely in a plane. You would, the one that you wanted to see is this I one. Yeah, and now uh, huh? it's not even drawn perfectly because this maximum should be at the zero crossing of the other one. Okay, and then it, then the field actually makes a circle, then you get circularly polarized light. And so, okay, X and Y component, and then you trace out the vector sum of the E fields and then it makes a circle. Okay. So these, uh, the, polarization the polarization state of light can change due to interaction with objects. And what kind of changes can we have done? And one of them is called dye attenuation. And that means that the intensity comes through the material depends on the polarization state. So if you look carefully, you see that the horizontal field is unaffected by this object, but the amplitude of the vertical one is has become smaller. So this is what you call dye attenuation. It's attenuation, but it's double or it's two different ones. The other um, change you can have is biofringence. Biofringence. Uh, means that after propagation through the material, one polarization state has, has shifted with respect to the other. So it has experienced a different refractive index. One way has traveled faster through the medium. And I have to be careful. I think it's the horizontal one that came out first. And the vertical one is slightly delayed with respect to the horizontal one. And you can characterize that by a retardation between these two waves in the precipice nanometer. The result of this delay is that the polarization state has changed. Right? Because in this, when it started off, it, the amplitude in X and Y is the same, and the phase was the same. So you had a linear polarization of less than 45 degrees. But after uh, the material, uh, there is slight, slight phase shift between the phase and it becomes partly circular. Point is that the, the polarization state has changed due to this biofringent material. Um, 
another one is that you get the rotation of the whole view, change of the orientation, rotation of the of the of both x and y, and the last one is uh, we call depolarization, where uh, the polarization states before and uh, before and after are completely uncorrelated, and so we've lost basically the information about polarization. Uh, whatever your instant polarization was on your media, you cannot recover. Uh, oh yeah, and then the opposite of that is a, is a polarization. It is a, uh, it's a, it's a polarizer. Uh, now we return, we, we, we come in with unpolarized light. You go to the medium and after the medium, you get nicely polarized light, the polarizer, uh, those kind. Okay, so we have these different, different effects. And if you then look at uh, how is polarization uh, used in scattering, uh, one of the ways you can use it is. Uh, reject multiple scattered light. So you, you send light through a medium, you have your um, incident state linear, let's say, and then you detect only the linear polarized light. And the idea is that the scattering will randomize the polarization. So if you put the filter or a different filter, it predominantly will merge with the unscattered photon. So you, uh, because the multiple scattered light has random polarization. So you can use it in uh, in, uh, in the detection. You can re reject a single scattered light. So the idea is that I have my incident polarization state on my medium, and then if it's single scattered, it has the same polarization state coming back. If I want to probe deeper into the tissue, I use from the detection a polarizer that is perpendicular to it, because the polarization needs to scramble in order to detect that. That means it has scattered more it has propagated deeper into the tissue. So rejecting a single scattered light with the orthogonal polarizer, we throw deeper into the tissue. And then the effect that I'm naming after and then this the polarization change in black tissue that changes in a predictable manner and that's biofringent. So biofringent is that effect where one state is related with respect to the other and it occurs in biological structures like collagen, muscles, nerves, tendons, and cartilage. Maybe basically all fiber structures have this property of bioprinting. So, and there are many fiber structures in the body, so you can use it as a contrast method for all these uh, different things. So, the question then is how, how can we measure it? And what do we need to measure? to characterize the polarization state and what do we need to measure to characterize the changes in the polarization state. So uh, purely polarized light is characterized by three parameters. It's the amplitude along X, the amplitude along Y, and the phase relation between the X field and the Y field. These three parameters are not to completely characterize the purely polarized light. Now there is one Additional additional parameter, and that is the, the, the light is partially polarized. So it's uh, it's it's not completely depolarized, but it's also not completely polarized. We call that the degree of polarization P. If I have an expression for it, not not yet. Let, let's get we got there. Yeah. Yeah. Dus ik hoef verder niks te doen. Oké. En moet ik hem ook pauze zetten als we gaan pauzeren, want we zijn al een tijdje bezig. Ja, ik heb het klaar. Oké. Ik doe even dit stukje en dan gaan we even thee drinken. Oké, dus. So let's say I have uh, this is uh, it's okay. I have to draw my hand. So this is my horizontal e field and this is my vertical uh, e field, component e field. And if you look at that, then you see that there's no relation between the phases and the amplitude of the x and y components. So that gives me unpolarized light. If I look at uh, this 
uh, field, then I see my horizontal component and my vertical component, and their amplitudes are pretty clear uh, due to the scoring uh, and the phases. So these give me uh, a correlation, these give me polarized line. Um, so, so it's not just necessarily the phase, because um, if I would argue that if you were to shift, let's say, the vertical component of the eagle, the lowest one, yeah, by let's say like a, a pi, yeah, um, it would still be in phase, yes, and still be polarized, yes, right. But it, it's so a... as in it's it's not really the phase; it's more like are the um, signals themselves identical, barring some phased vision. That's it. Yes, yes, yes. So it's a. Uh, um... If I look at the, the at this theory and go, let's say, five uh, wavelengths further in my way, or I could also go in time five waves further, is that correlation maintained? And do I still have the same periodicity and the same phase? And that makes it uh, a correlated polarized slide. If I look at this one, Strictly speaking, you know, from here to here, I can define a polarization state. I have my E field, X component doing something, and my Y component doing something. I can plot out what my E field does. But the point for this one is that it completely jumps yeah. around as a function of time. And there is no correlation between this time and it's a little bit later. So it's that loss of correlation with the function of time or delay uh, that 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 makes it in polarized. It's that's it, it, so polarizing polarization is very interesting definition because if you look at the the time scale of a single cycle of the electromagnetic wave, it's a loss. Yeah, exactly. That's so, uh, yeah. And you can measure that with OCT. Yeah. Um, okay, but where are we? I just a little bit back on on that coherence, yeah, because um, the question is, what are processes that can change the degree of polarization? So, what can lead to depolarized depolarizing the light? So, let's have my laser here. What do I need to do with the, to the light to make it unpolarized? That's um, actually processes that involve transfer of phase. Because if I have a phase transfer of my electromagnetic wave to something else, I end up with the random phase because I don't know how much phase I've given to the other molecule or whatever the vibration was. That's that's lots of coherence. And so that is inelastic scattering. And when there's absorption of light and uh, the emission, the Ramel scattering, clear example, fluorescent or clear example for processes that that that, that uh, where you lose uh, the degree of polarization. Elastic scattering preserves coherence. So now you get into uh, a, a different idea because what people often say is, oh, I have my polarized light, it goes, it goes to uh, a, a random medium and then out of my unpolarized light. Well, it depends really on how, again, on how you define unpolarized. Because I can look at my static collection of particles and I can be one observer that looks at one particular point in space at one of my speckles. That speckle is stable and the particles don't move. If I look at the electromagnetic field that I measure, it can be very constant polarization. What makes it random is that I move a little bit. Then I measure completely different polarization. So I can move a little bit. Different. So the definition of degree of polarization is actually not that easy. Right? And you have to really think about the concept. What does it mean? Uh, is it randomized? Yes, after a scattered medium, if you average over a certain area. But if you look at one point, you can definitely still perfectly polarized. Second harmonic generation. Have you heard about the process? It's converting two photons into one new photon with double the frequency. Yeah, like I, 
as in um, see how you like I I can imagine for example uh, phosphorescence let's say or uh, fluorescence where you could have two photons right so combining the energy with another photon being emitted mm -hmm. like uh, twice the frequency yeah that is two photon microscopy yeah, yeah, where right. you basically use a very intense pulse beam and then you you have a certain uh, excite, the molecule. excite yeah you need a certain energy to excite the molecule but it can only be provided by the energy of two photons so that's a two photon process but that is still a two photon process where you create fluorescence and so uh, according to my definitions here then that fluorescence light you have lost uh, uh, there's strength to a phase, so you have lost the coherence, you've lost the, uh, you, you change the degree of polarization. But now, if you look at, uh, you can do second harmonic generation in the crystal. Now, you have your incident laser, and in that crystal, you convert two photons to one photon of higher energy, double the energy. How is that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can, if you really want to know. It's the effect when you have an oscillator and you drive it. And if you drive it at the low frequency, it responds at the same frequency. But it's, it's like if you have an electron in the, in the harmonic potential, right? And then you start driving the electron and it responds well. But if the potential is not perfectly harmonic, at some point there will be higher modes that you excite when driving it. That's that's how you generate the second harmonic light. At some point, your your, your electron is going to oscillate in that well, but it's going to also oscillate at double the frequency and triple the frequency. And that's the process of second or third harmonic potential. So it occurs, um, you know, because every potential that you put an electron in the first approximation is it's a harmonic well. But you know, only when you start driving that thing like crazy, you get higher order effects and you cannot approximate it anymore with a perfectly harmonic well. It's a well, it's a different shape, and that's where you say the harmonic comes in. So it's a perturbation on the harmonic well. But now you deeply understand second harmonic. <laughs> <laughs> But that's physics, right? The first you start off the simplest problem is well, let's make it our model as well. Because then it's like it's only response at the frequency I drive it. But that, that's not the reality. That energy crystals are real. <laughs> oh wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I there is too good at that. Anyway, so that we were at the second number of generation, I asked the big question. You can say yes or no, but there, is that an elastic or an emergency? But oh, here's the jerk. So, so the question is, so yes, any idea why? Um, the, the answer is that you have the two photons with their two phases are summed up into one photon that carries the information with both phases in it. And so uh, that's why it, it, it is still perfectly correlated to the original incoming waves. If you, however, have one photon that splits up into, then one photon carries a little bit of phase and the other one carries a little bit of phase information and it can be completely different. So then you lose it from the phase, like a round process. So, Second harmonic is a perfectly coherent process. So then how would you define coherence in a sense? Um, because if you look at single photons, I would say like it doesn't really make sense to talk about coherence or polarization when you talk about single photon, right? Yeah. So, so, so I could imagine shooting a beam at the crystal. And yeah, sure, for all the individual um, photons combining the Photon coming out would be coherent, but then because this process is so sort of random and for lots of photons, the, the outcoming beam would still be incoherent. Let's say. Uh, well, one assumption is that the source is uh, the laser. So that means that the two photons have a perfect phase to base. If, if you would do second harmonic generation with sunlight, the whole picture breaks down. The easiness, you know. You can't even generate second now, mate. You should be too. Oh. 
two-thirds order of reformation. Two-fifths, that's it. Okay. Uh, uh, you get my point that if it's a laser, then all the problems are in phase, and then they, their phase is at night, so you need to put your phase. Uh, but if you do the reverse and you have one photon breaks down into two photons, then that break, that, that process can be different every time it happens. So if you look at the photon picture, it happens once in each carry a certain amount of phase, and then you have a second time, the amount of phase you carry different. And that, that makes it now incoherent over time because the argument here was that you know coherent is something it means that it repeats itself over time or there is correlation over time with what I meant. With the, the revert two photons into one, so two photons have a very defined phase, and that there's there's completely deterministic what the phase of the second harmonic photon is. I mean the, the proof is by uh, generating a uh, second harmonic light and putting it in a microscopic chromatograph and delaying one arc with respect right. to the other, and see if it interferes. Right. And it does. So <laughs> that, that, is, that facilitates the, arc, the, the correctness of the arc. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's take a break. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's take a break. I think there's EU back Question.
Want zijn er eentjes hebben al zeven keer gewonnen. Dus ja, ja, ja. Tien jaar lang. Um, dat is eigenlijk altijd een vrij kleine aanpassing moet ik maken. En dan wint hij weer. <laughs> wel een beetje gezelligheid is. Er zijn wel andere teams die wel heel, heel, heel serieus en heel hoog ijs en shit. Maar ja, het verschilt een beetje. Oké, okay, maar laten we teruggaan naar, uh, naar wat we net zo werken. Wat je kunt doen met de polarized light. Zo, zoals ik zei, polarizing biological structures. Uh, de uh, the, the interesting thing is dat um, uh, if we have light that propagates, oké, okay. okay. also perpendicular to the primary direction or parallel to the primary direction, it experiences a different refractive index. Uh, so when it's parallel to the primary direction, it's still larger than when it's perpendicular to the primary direction. Okay. If you want to know, can I calculate that? The answer is yes. Because me, which that me has solved exactly the scattering pattern for a sphere. And uh, you can, so that's the sphere with a certain refractive index in the middle of different refractive index. You can exactly solve the scattering pattern. That's one of the very few objects that you can exactly solve. But I think they've extended now a little bit to a ellipsoid, but that's about it. You can also do it for a cylinder. Can exactly solve the cylinder. And now it's very interesting is that when you can calculate it exactly, you know the phase of the field that's scattered of the cylinder. And then you look at the phase for this polarization state and this polarization state, and the scattered field is a slight, has a small phase shift. That's the effect of biofringing. Because how do you create a delay? Think about how you, you know, do you understand how a refractive image actually works in the material in the glass? Depends on the level of analysis. <laughs> well, let's say, you know, it goes, the beam goes through air, there, you don't excite anything. But then you go through glass, you excite the electron clouds, like I explained to you now, right? So you the electron clouds that start oscillating, and it's these oscillating clouds that emit another secondary electromagnetic wave. This wave is actually slightly out of phase with the original one. So you send the original one with the that the bit, uh, uh, secondary one, you get a new way that has a slightly different phase. And it's the space difference that is actually, the, it slows down the propagation from the layer of the refractive index. So the same holds for the scattering process where you have a slight phase difference in the scattered field, and that it slows down one way with respect to the other, and there you have your, your biofrenzy properties. So phase retardation then, eh? it's due to form biorefringence. I call it form biorefringence because it's associated with the fiber structure. Just the fiber itself generates the effect already. And then you get the phase retardation between the horizontal and the vertical components of the wave. That's what we're interested in. Um, so this is an example then of how a biofringent material can change the polarization state. So I have my input state here. It's a linear input state of plus 45 degrees. I've drawn it here. In yellow is the horizontal component, the blue is the vertical component. It goes through this material that has a slow axis and a fast axis. The fast axis is the horizontal one. So the horizontal wave propagates faster through the material than the blue wave. I've basically given it a fine phase change. And if I then look at the output polarization state in some of these fields, 
you get a factor at minus 45 degrees. So the, the biophysical material has changed the polarization state from linear plus 45 to linear minus 45. And then uh, let's take an eye. Uh, so what kind of biorefringion structures do we have in an eye? Well, actually, it's a lot. It's uh, the collagen. So it's the whole sphere around the one of these two, two, two structural integrity to your eye. It's biorefringion. Uh, muscles that are pulling on the globe on the outside are biorefringion. The nerves, which means all the nerves that collect here and go through the optic nerve pair are biorefringion. The tendons, the cartilage, even the cornea here is biorefringent and, uh, and also the lens. So, all fiber structures all uh, show some more or less amount of biorefringence. So, these are cornea, lens, sclera, uh, nerve fiber layer. And then if you look at the OCT images, so this is one of the cross section. This is that nerve fiber layer that is basically on top of the retina, that is the biorefringent structure. And then also the this this what is called this Henley layer, Henley fiber layer is uh, also biorefringent. And then the photoreceptors and the layers below the RP. So now the question is. How do we detect these very small changes in the polarization state with an OCT system? And so the, 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 this is then the basic configuration. And I'm not even going to share it as well. We take the light source, we polarize it, we send it to the beam splitter. Uh, half of the light goes to your central arm, the other half to your uh, reference arm, and then light is reflected here, we combine, and then in your detection arm, the extension that you have here is a polarizing beam splitter that splits the light into a horizontal and vertical component. Uh, you see two elements here, quarter weight plates. Uh, any idea what a quarter weight plate is? Yeah, it so changes the, the rotation of the base by a quarter. Yes, exactly. So it is the plate where one wave is delayed a quarter of the wave with respect to the other. So a quarter of a wave retardation means that it turns a linear line into a circular line. And if you put a circular line, it turns it back into a linear line. So if you, and, but the, the instant light needs to be at 45 degrees to the optic axis of the material, right? So here it is at 45. So what happens is the instant light here into the sample is circularly polarized. Here it's actually on a single pass. It's not cir fully circularly polarized, but on the double pass through this quarter wave plate, this arm is circularly polarized. And then what's the nice thing about circular polarization? It splits in equal halves here into the, in the horizontal and vertical component. So for my reference arm, I get half to the horizontal detector and half to the vertical detector. It's important because the amplitude that I measure is proportional to the field from the reference half. Okay, so now I have this setup. I can measure fringes in my horizontal and vertical polarization state. And let's take a look at what I can measure. So let's say on my vertical channel, I measure no interference fringes. I only measure interference from my horizontal channel. What kind of polarization state do I have? I know you were writing, so you were yeah, doing, so I'll give you some time to absorb. This is a graph of uh, the signals that I see on these two detectors. Uh, so this is my vertical channel, and this is my horizontal channel. On my vertical channel, I see no interference. Oh, wait, actually, yeah, I know. And now on my horizontal channel, I see an interference pattern. What is the polarization state that is coming back to my cell phone? Yeah, it always depends a bit on how you define the vertical and horizontal channel. Well, the, the, the thing is, like, if, right, so if, if our filter is um, vertical and you detect nothing, it means that the incoming light was actually horizontal. What I mean here is that. Uh, the, it filters the light into the, this is a polarizing beam splitter. So the 
only the horizontally polarized light will pass through this. So this detector only measures horizontal, the horizontal component of the, the electromagnetic field, and this will only measure the vertical component. So if I have vertically polarized light, everything will go to this detector. Do I have uh, 45 degree polarized light? Half of it will go to this detector, half to this one. It's perfectly horizontally polarized, it will only go to this one. But remember, for my reference arm, I get an equal amount here and an equal amount here. So I always get my reference arm right in this detector. That's how I set up my geometry. But it mixes with the sample arm. If there's no horizontal component in my sample arm, there's nothing for the reference arm to interfere with. So I won't see anything. Yeah, so the, that is what I mean with. In my vertical channel, there's no interference. It means that when I see my reference arm line, if there's, a, there's apparently no vertical polarized sample arm line that's introduced that creates an interference. And I'm see that. And now that you get the answer. So, what is the polarization state that's coming back from my sample arm? No, exactly. Only and now I have this example. So, I have interference. In my horizontal and in my vertical channel, and even nicer, they are in phase. That's a try again. Mm -hmm. Then I get a diagonal 45 degrees. And uh, I can also have the case where that vertical and horizontal channel are um, uh, 90 degrees out of phase. It interferes sometimes. Then I get circular polarized. So by looking at the, the these detectors, uh, these two detectors, I can determine completely the polarization state that's coming back to my sample arm. And like I said in the beginning, what completely characterizes uh, the polarization state is amplitude along x, amplitude along y, and the phase difference between the x and y component. And all these three parameters I can extract from this measurement. I have the amplitude along X, I have the amplitude along Y, and I have the relative phase between the X and Y component. In one measurement, I can completely characterize the polarization state. That's interesting because if you go back in history, if you want to properly characterize the polarization state, you needed four measurements because it was intensity based. If you do it in this interferometric way, one measurement is enough. Okay, so what can you do with it? Actually, this is uh, a measurement of the muscle of a mouse. Here you see the intensity, and here you see these parameters Q, U, and V, where Q is how much vertically polarized light is there, or sorry, horizontally polarized light is there, and um, that can be in this direction or that can be in this direction. And let's say horizontally polarized equal positive one, and then vertically polarized is minus one. For this one, it's linear plus 45 is plus one, and linear and minus 45 is minus one. And then for the circular one, it's like left circular or right circular, plus or minus one. And then here I look at the intensity. This is what I see for the amount of Q. That I get back as a function of that, that this is the amount of U and this is the amount of V. And then the color goes from black to white, from minus one to one. This is just the amount of intensity that comes back, and this is how the polarization state changes as a function of that. So we can measure perfectly, you know, that phase delay that builds up if it travels from here and back to here and back, to here and back, and then the phase that increases and increases, you see the graph. And basically on the surface, it's gray, and it goes to black, to white, to black. So this is one full wave delay. This is one full wave delay. You can see from going from U to V that they're nicely out of phase. That's all, you know, U is linear, V is circular, so V means uh, well, another quarter of a wave delay. You can see that that happens earlier. So it gives a 
beautiful picture of what is bioprinting material. You can actually measure something, and I'll show you later, you know, what kind of relevant things you can measure with that. I've got a very basic question. Yeah. How do you measure the phase of light to make things like long to very fast? It absolutely is. Uh, so this is a simplified picture. What I'm showing you is some of the theorems that I, that I measure. So the, the phase of one field you cannot measure. You can measure that set the relative phase between the sample and the reference arm. And that is what is shown here. That in the first pattern shows the relative phase between the reference and sample arm. I cannot measure the absolute phase. But the and then it, it, it's a little bit complicated. But this is a simplistic picture because the, the the what you really need in this setup is that what arrives here is perfectly per is per perfectly linear polarized light. So when it splits up the field of the reference arm and this field of the reference arm have the same phase, and then I compare it with the sample arm. And then I get the right phase difference between this sample arm component and this sample arm component. But if I if I put in circularly polarized light, then this reference field and this reference field will be a quarter of a way out of phase. Now the trick question is my interference pattern, let's say my interference pattern here is perfectly in phase. But my reference arm is a quarter of a way out of phase with the with the other one. What does that mean for my sample arm? It's circular. Sorry? It's circular. Just let's call it. The, the sample arm is circular. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's what needs to happen, right? It 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 needs to have a quarter of a way phase. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, oh the my English. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so you know, the reference and this reference are half a way out, a quarter of a way out of phase, but the interference is exactly in phase. Then the, the original sample arm line must also have that quarter of a way out of phase better, otherwise it won't generate. So, so this, you know, when I say, oh, I can measure the polarization state from my sample, not quite true. Um, but, uh, we need to work around this. Okay, so the 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 way yeah, this is this is the classical way of looking at polarization. That is uh, the definition of the Stokes parameters, and this, defi this definition is based on the densities. Like this is the way you can actually measure. You take a light beam, you take a polarizer, you, pull, you, you measure the horizontal polarization component, you measure the vertical component, you measure the the plus 45 and minus 45 and measure the circular components. And if you have measured all these things, you have to determine completely the polarization state of light according to the stock parameters. And then you can now can also fulfill your desire to know what's now the degree of polarization that is the Q squared squared U squared plus B squared divided by the intensity. And that's now not my this definition of the degree of polarization. Okay, so the point is you need four independent measurements to, to determine these stock parameters. While if the principle I showed you before, it is experimental where you only need one. Let's look at, let's try and gain a little insight in what uh, this bioprinting does to the polarization state. And, and a very useful way of looking at that is, uh, is the Poincaré sphere. So this is a sphere, and each point on the surface of the sphere indicates a polarization state. And so this point here, I have a minus U polarization state. Here I have a plus U minus P plus P, U minus Q. Now, the, the, what you can immediately imagine is Let's say I have my bioprinting material and it has an optic axis like this and an optic axis like this, which means that this forest light along this axis has a different uh, speed than along this axis. If I probe this light with a vertical polarization state, 
Will it change after the sample? Do you agree? Yes. <laughs> Very good. Well, the point is there is no vertical component, so there's only one delay. And so that light stays perfectly uh, vertical. Okay? Um, if I have circular polarization state, will I measure the change in the polarization state after this material? Yeah, I guess it could become diagonal, or it depends a bit on the properties of the components. But of course, the uh, when you have circular light, then one of the components has a delay, basically retardation, which can then be exaggerated or corrected. Let's say. Yeah, the, the point is, it will always change. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's course, the difference right, yeah. with perfectly vertical. It will not change, but circular will always change, right? And uh, that is nicely illustrated in the Poincaré sphere because the, the change of the polarization state is defined by a rotation around an axis in this pure plane. And so if that's if this polarization rotates around an axis in the pure plane, this one is always perpendicular to the rotation axis, but will always change. But if this is my rotation axis, basically along U, and I come in. You, it rotates, doesn't change the state, nicely reflects my sound, my optic axis at plus or minus 45 degrees, and my instant polarization at 45, and nothing changed. So, that is this one gray sphere can nicely visualize how the polarization state changes. And then, you know, the changing of the optic axis, rotation of the optic axis. It's basically, I change the axis around which I rotate in the concrete. I can visualize what happens. And you immediately see that the best polarization state to probe my sample with is circular. Because regardless of how the optic axis is oriented, oriented in my sample, and regardless of what the fiber direction is, with circular light, it always changes. And I understand why we use the quarter wave plate in the sample arm. Okay, uh, and this is a, a representation then of that, that if you have the circular state, it rotates, the, the angle of which it rotates then is the amount of vibrations of the sample, and then you can basically write out how your incident state, this is an incident circular state, right? intensity is one, Q component and U component is zero, V component is one, and then it changes after this material into uh, an expression this is the new uh, stock vector after uh, uh, well, propagating through the material and rotating over angle delta. What are those uh, matrices called again? Um, remember the word you've got these matrices which you know identify for uh, for stock vectors, yeah, that's a four component intensity vector, it's a Muller matrix. And then the ones that you might refer to, because that is that is a Jones matrix. All oh, right, yeah, the Jones matrix. Yeah, so the Jones matrix is for fields. Huh? So right. uh, the, the, yeah. so the Jones matrix, you have a Jones matrix that describes this material. So you have your incident E field horizontal and vertical components, which are complex numbers. You propagate through the material and you end up with your uh, resulting field E prime. And you can write that down as uh, and so your instant field times the Jones matrix times also an additional common phase delay. That's how far it has propagated through the material. Gives you your new uh, input, uh, your, your output state. And you can formalize that with the vector E multiplied with the two dimensional matrix uh, and gives you your resulting field. And then this is a, a complex two by two matrix. That's how you're. So, and then if you can look deeper into the definite load matrix, it's composed of four complex number. There's an arbitrary base vector. So you have in total seven independent variables. You can map these seven independent variables each to a bioprinted effect or a dice information effect. Uh, I, I want to talk about this is a bit old school. But the point is then that if you have multiple layers behind one another, 
uh, then you can you can calculate the combined effect by first having the jumps made to the first element and to the second element in the tissue by the combined effect of the uh, object. So you basically multiply jumps matrices. Now, nice thing about jumps matrices is that they, they span a group, it's the SU2 group. And I have you had a little bit of group theory? Yeah, okay. So with SU2. So it's a group that means that all these things of matrix multiplications apply uh, to the, the group theory for, for SU2 applies to all these matrix uh, multiplications and you can make use of that to you know, prove things that you need. Okay, so um, how do we measure that? And we measure it in, a, in, a, in the following way. Um, we have our sample arm and, and we have we split the polarization state in the sample arm with two paths, the green path and a red path. And these paths have different length. So my reference arm is the same length, but my sample arm is different in length for one polarization state versus the other. These polarization states, these two polarization states go into the retina, come back and mix with the reference arm. So basically you can view this as I probe my sample with this polarization state and slightly a little bit later with this one. That's the, the what this delay creates. If we then look at my OCT image, I actually, when I make a depth scan, I see two images. First one for the first polarization state, but at a larger depth, I see the second state. So, my single A line consists of these two images. And uh, so I, 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 and this image is created by one detector, and this image is simultaneously generated by the other detector. So with one scan, one depth probe, but one scan, I generate four images. Uh, this one, Horizontal and vertical component for incident state one, horizontal and vertical component for incident state two. The nice thing is that I basically have measured four components. I basically measured in full Muller matrix, right? Now I can take a look at this location in my sample. For that one location in my sample, I have four numbers, complex numbers actually. Because it's the interference between sample and reference arm. So each point, for each point, I have a full Muller matrix. And if I'm sorry, move Jones matrix, sorry, let's say Jones matrix. For each point, I have a full Jones matrix. So I can now calculate from one point in depth to the other point in depth and measure a transformation of the, of the Jones matrix. I can calculate what the matrix is that transforms one matrix to the other one. And that I have a full Jones matrix for propagating over 10 microns in the sample. So that allows me to extract full polarization properties of the sample. Okay. So uh, let me see what happens next. Yeah, I first going to show you some samples and then a little bit more of, uh, you know, how you use these Muller, the, these Jones matrices to extract uh, the details of the polarization state and what you can do with it then, right? So, first of all, we go back to the retina. This is our fast image. This is the focus. This is the optic nerve. And what we plot up here is the optic axis that we measure of the tissue. And then it's color coded. Huh? So, the color codes for direction. And if I look, uh, basically what you see here is that there is a radial pattern of the fibers in this area. It runs like this, radially up. This is in the phobia. This was the area where you have your highest density of protein receptors. They need to, each protein receptor needs to have its nerve going to the optic nerve. So what happens from out of the, sorry, how do I, from the, out of the point, basically all these, sorry, these nerves go out like this and then accumulate. You want them radially out and it's little in the way and then collect and go. So that is what you see, you see that radial pattern. If you then look at the optic nerve head here, this is where all these nerves come in from all these different directions. 
Ik denk in Nerger dat we weten ook dat. Hè? Zo, if we would plot the direction, the distance direction, if we see sperm fiber accumulate. The other thing we can look at is the phase retardation. So the total retardation that occurs at the, at the let's say, at the bottom of the image. And then you can see a, a pattern like this. So what we see here is that this area is more biofrinsic or the, the biofrinsic layer is thicker than somewhere else, right? And that's interesting because we know that the, the nerves accumulate towards the optic nerve head in sort of a bow pattern. So if this is the fovea, and then five of these nerves go in this direction, and then they turn around and they come in from all directions in towards the optic nerve head in bundle. These are then the thick bundles. Because they're thicker, if I go all the way through them, the polarization state changes larger, phase is larger, so I see that. But this now gives me a means, a different way of measuring the thickness of this nerve fiber layer by looking at the biofrinsic properties. Now, this is of great interest to ophthalmologists who want to look at glaucoma. Uh, glaucoma is a slowly blinding disease. Cause are not really known, but the thickness of this layer is affected. But if you can measure that accurately, uh, decay over one or two years, you can tune medication for these patients and, and, and slow down the process. You cannot reverse it, but the best you can do is slow it down. And the idea is then you slow it so much down that they die before they go blind. They've solved the problem. So it will become thinner. It will become thinner over time. Basically, it's increased eye pressure, and uh, the, the, they don't really know why these uh, nerves die, but they can control the eye pressure and then reduce the effect. But how much do you do? How much do you reduce eye pressure? Because it's also it has side effects. This medication, so you want to you want to tune that. But to tune it, you need good feedback on what you're doing. So you want to measure as as soon as possible, if that decay is still progressing at the rate that we don't like. So really measuring these nerve fiber layers is a thickness is really a problem or an issue. They want to do it as accurately as possible. And this is a, basically a new method. The argument that we haven't, we've done this a long time ago, but if you want to do proper glaucoma research, you need to enroll like 400 patients. So it's a really big study and I'm not ready for that. <laughs> Uh, but the point is that that the amount of biofringence, it's not unreasonable to assume that it has to do with the fiber density. Now you have something here because you can measure thickness. But what is really important is the density of these nerve fibers, because you know if they just if half of them drops out, atrophies, but it, they still remain there, yeah. Okay, what do you measure? You can measure the thickness, but it doesn't change. It's the it's the it's the density of the, the axons that is really important. And we think this is a means of measuring the density of these axons. Why it could be an er, earlier indicator of the of of of, uh, of nerve damage than just thickness measurements. Okay. Well, you know, if you want to do four hundred patients, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's I'm not ready for that. I think we have to wait until a commercial company commercializes this, and then then it's proper. Uh, but you know, this is an example then of uh, of uh, a glaucoma patient, and in detail, you see the difference in the colors for these nerve bundles. So these are really attractive and very similar. Okay, but this is this is like a really advanced glaucoma patient. So it's, you know, you merge, it's no problem. That's easy. The, the the art is in the subtle changes. Okay, so like I said, we can measure. Uh, a Jones matrix over a small distance because we can measure Jones matrix at two depth locations and then from the difference you can calculate the transformation of the scheme. So we have Jones matrix. So the current way of processing the data, and I think it still can be done better, but this is where we are now, is we can turn this uh, Jones matrix into a ruler matrix. Uh, and there's a standard transformation for that. And this Muller matrix, we can differentiate. Uh, basically, we want to know the derivative 
for changing from A to B. And, and why do we want the derivative? Well, it's like a Taylor series that we want to know the chain. It refers to approximation is the first thing. Okay. You get, you get the feeling. Okay, so this differential Muller matrix, uh, we're very interested in because it has some uh, it has some nice properties in the way parameters are displayed in this Muller matrix. So for instance, if we um if we have this is this is a Muller matrix for viral transients, and this is a Muller matrix for uh, attenuation. Uh, how can you see that? Uh, it attenuates the, the intensity, but it attenuates the Q, U, and V factor in the same amount. So this is the attenuating the mean. This one, you can see uh, the intensity remains the same, the Q component remains the same, U and V change. Why? Because the Q changes, remains the same because the optic axis is subordinated such that the Q in state is along the optic axis, so it doesn't change. And then you see the U and V. If you, this is a rotation matrix, you recognize it. Better. If you turn that into a differential matrix, this one looks like. Uh, Okay, so actually, if you take the product of these two, then you calculate this is the product matrix, and then you look at the differential matrix, and it looks like. And what is now the beauty of this, this matrix? It shows the alpha on the diagonal, which is my attenuation, and it shows my eta on these off diagonal elements expressing here the bioreferential. So this differential. Ruler matrix is uh, is very useful to um, to 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 extract the parameters. Okay. In a way, uh, uh, there's always a way of writing a, a, a matrix in an exponent form. Huh? That's basically uh, what what it is. You you extract the matrix in its exponent form. So you have a matrix M. You can write that e to the power. Uh, these are matrices. It's possible. Mm -hmm. It's an uh, exception. And basically, what you do here is you go to the differential approximation, you find this one. And this one has like, it's, it's basically decomposing that Muller matrix into like its base form, base vectors. And that's what you see here. And so, what does it, what, what does it mean? So, for an arbitrary uh, matrix, uh, you can it 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 goes it, it boils down to this form huh? where this one I have explained that is just the attenuation of the B. This and this part is your die attenuation. It's the it's the um, that one polarization state weakens more than another one. Okay, it's a loss of energy. Measure. This because it's a uh, this part is now the one that completely covers viral transfer. And if you look at it, it's a, uh, it's a rotation matrix. Uh, from this rotation matrix, I can extract this part here, uh, mu, mu, and eta, as a three-parameter thing. And this three-parameter thing, I can now write as a vector. I'll slow down if you want to keep going on. Yes. Okay, so this one is my attenuation. This one is my bioreferences. I can extract it as a vector, bioreferences vector. The interesting thing is that the length of this vector is now proportional to the amount of bioreferences, the amount of change. Right? The first derivative in the key here. Okay. I'm yes. just thinking for a sec. Um, see, we went from the joints matrix to the Mueller matrices. Yeah. Let me take the derivative. I can see why you take the derivative so you can see the change. Yeah. But why change to Mueller matrices in the first place? Because like they cannot really carry more information. The information should already be in the third place. Yeah. yeah. So you agree. I totally agree. Uh, so the 
This part is from a group in the US, yeah. uh, my former, the place where I former work, and uh, we use it because it works, but I'm still not completely happy about Jonathan Jones from Newman. I don't think it's necessary. Mm -hmm. that, and also, when you go to the exponential representation for the for the Mueller, you can do the same uh, um, exponential representation for Jones. Yeah. And I think that you can follow that path the same way you can do it. But okay, you know, Mueller and Jones formulation are really very equivalent. It's the, it's the mapping between SU2, which is Jones, to SO3, which is rotation, which is the Mueller matrix, or it's it's only the but this is the O2 O3 group. The three, three by three matrix is describing rotation. And ro rotations don't include loss. And the lost part is in that diatomulated part that sits here. Um, so it's a, it's all about you know the mapping between SU2 and SO3 and how we insert this cell. A very interesting idea on how I'm going to do this in the Jones formulation. I think I'll be very Actually, I was going to um, to the theory, the master uh, thingy things, and try and push this idea there. <laughs> oh, that's if I can find something. Anyway, uh, but where are we now? We have these 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 three elements. Okay, so blah, 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 blah. Oh, well, okay. So this, if you, uh, you're at home and you go through your slides, diatomulation components purple, the third in yellow, biofins in blue. Um, okay, so now we have this vector that we extracted from this Muller matrix where we have the, a direction and a length. Where the length is proportional to the amount of biofins. And if the direction basically gives you the optical axis in the material. Okay, so what can we do with this? The problem is that we always measure noise. Right? So if we just measure it, then any material will be biofilm based on the noise of the signals that you make. But we can look, look at the little region. And if we measure an optic axis that is basically random over a region and think about. 50 to 50 microns versus a measurement where all these vectors are more or less pointing in the same direction, then this is much more likely to be biorefringent than this. So we use this, this, these vectors to average out and find their regions of signal. And we, we, what we define now is a parameter called optic axis uniformity, which basically tells you does it sum up nicely like this? Uniformity is one, completely random, uniformity is zero. Uh, what happens next? Uh, so I I needed all this to show you the next images, but then the question is how do you generate these images? So we build a catheter with a tiny motor at the tip, and then the motor rotates. Catheter is 1.35 millimeter. We can pull it back. So this is what we call lighthouse scanning, and you pull back and you have the whole volume of a, of a lumen. And we're going to do this in the lung. This is the actual catheter uh, that was built by the machine shop. So this is a this is a motor built by hand. Right. It's insane. Uh, and this is then the very first measurement in. Uh, in a patient. So the very first time we did it in a, in a long patient here at the VMC. Uh, lots of paperwork to get this approved, but then, hey, there you are. Okay, then uh, what I said, um, the biorefringes and the optics axis uniformity. So here, uh, this, is, um, this is not really what we're used to in terms of OTP, but this OTP image has been converted into how much does it scatter, scatter back? So I have basically eliminated the exponential decay of longer beer in our signal. And you're seeing really the local properties, scattering properties of the tissue in this image. This image, you see the biorefringence that is extracted from the length of this vector. You see some really vague, well, vague 
this is the axis of the problem. But you see, now you see a path here, right? So you can much better identify these regions where there is uh, a fibrous layer. And, and in this case, you know what it is. This is the muscle layer that is lying around the lumen of the lung. So we're looking at the lumen of the lung that is like two millimeters in diameter. And around that lumen are muscles. And this is a muscle where we'll later find out what the orientation of the muscle is, but because we know the optic axis, so we can determine is it the muscle that lies around it in a circumferential way, or is it one that lies along? Yeah. So, so what exactly are you measuring with the optic axis uniformly? Like I get the duration of my fringes. The, the uniformity of this axis. And the point is that um, you will always measure a optic axis because of noise in your measurement. It's not perfect. Then, like, there's always shot noise. So you will always measure something. But is it meaningful? If it's noise, then this pixel we have an optic axis. Oh, this the is neighboring like the version of the slide. Oh, yes, yeah. Ah, okay. That's what I meant, uniformity. Ah, and yes. the uniformity, I meant that you you take it, you take a certain yes, area and then you average. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Okay. And now so I now I have this this optic axis uniformity parameter, and I and it clearly creates a band there. Which, which is nice because uh, well later on I, I know that is the nerve that is the muscle layer around the nerve. So now we go. Let's see where are we pointing? Yeah. So I'm going to finish this. This is this is the last part actually. So um, this is a study to look at asthma patients, and the, the problem in these asthma patients is. Uh, uh, it's the uncontrolled asthma. So you have a group of patients that respond well to therapy uh, with the inhaler, so they're they're under control. And you have another group that basically they worsen, they still have uh, incidents, they need to go to the emergency room and stuff like that. So it's that you call it out of control. So what do you do for these patients? Well, there is one therapy, and that is called. Uh, uh, bronchial therapy. Oh, let's go first to what 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 is the problem with asthma. So you have a normal airway, and this is an asthmatic airway where you have inflammation in the walls, but also uh, a thickened nerve a muscle layer around the the lumen, which can contract, and the contraction is what causes the asthma attack. And then you have you feel a shortness of breath, the tightening of these smooth muscles around the area. And why do these muscles tighten? That is a enormous irritation um, alone, but it happens. And so the therapy that they have now is thermal, thermal, thermoplasty, is that you go in with the catheter, uh, you heat up the, the walls of the, of the lung, the lung, you heat it up. And, and with that heat, you damage the muscle. And the idea is that after the therapy, the muscles are thinner and they are not as strong to do these contractions and alleviate the symptoms. Uh, another way of looking at it is if you have a regular asthma attack, it's like going to the gym. Hey, nice to drain these muscles. <laughs> so it gets worse. Uh, it's a simplistic, but maybe very useful view of what's going on. So let's, let's burn them over. <laughs> Are there no so, like side effects? Or are like, in the book form to do other procedures in the body? Yeah, like it, I, like well, is it just that with the asthma, asthma patients that the muscles like overreact or are they actually like too strong? That's a good question. I said now are they thicker than the normal? Yes. And how do you measure them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, but don't, is it the heart for this therapy? Well, you heat it up to about 60 degrees. So uh, the denaturation temperature is about uh, uh, 45 to 60. So you, you, you're creating damage, you create a burn, you create a scar. Yeah, well, so yeah. I, I wasn't even too concerned with like direct uh, consequences, but more 
right? So that's sort of two scenarios in my, in my head. One is as many patients have like three thick muscles by default, yeah. in which way, case just spread it away, right? Fine. In the other case, it might just be that the muscles are normal thickness, but they sort of over respond. Yeah. So you can thin in them so the over response isn't like as bad in practice, right? Yeah. But then there might be other side effects because, well, now the muscles are thinner than they really should be, ideally. Yeah. So it's more thinking about that. Yeah. So uh, what they do is uh, to, to study this, uh, they have taken biopsies of these lungs to figure out what is the natural amount of hair and smooth muscle. Okay. But it's very difficult to take these biopsies. So what, where they took the biopsies is right here. That is called the corona. So let's say this is a lumen, this is a lumen. Eh? You have the lung splits up. Mm -hmm. And then this area, when you go in, you can nicely take a little piece of tissue. Very difficult to take a bite out of the wall when you're inside. So they always measure what is called the current. They measure here. That's how you determine the muscle content. Is that a good representation of what happens in the lumen? The answer is we don't know. <laughs> so that's sustainable. So there you go. So, but in the study that uh, what we try to do is uh, uh, we have these patients, we try to measure before they get the treatment and after they get the treatment. And then we, from our measurements, we try to determine the thickness of the uh, smooth muscle and we compare it with the measurements from histology that were taken at the corona. So we do also the imaging, we do the treatment. Six months later, we repeat the imaging on the same patients. Actually, we only managed to do that with one patient where we could do with before and after, and then we had uh, do more after only patients. Even the study with four patients, you can get published. <laughs> 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 yeah, you'll know why. Uh, so this is uh, this is the histology of the moon, right? And then so this is the standard ACE stain, and this is the Desmond stain, which only stains in brown the smooth muscle. So here you can see, you know, where is that smooth muscle? Hard to see in the HE that much, but this one I can recognize this then as muscle. But uh, this is nice stain, so this is this is tells you the amount of fibers. So then we go to the uh, the images that we require. So this is your a standard intensity OCD image in the lumen. I told you we convert that to an attenuation coefficient. This is particular algorithm that went into detail. But I hope that when I start this movie, you appreciate the difference between these two. Let me point out what, what, what you should look for. So if, if you look here, you see this, this, and this here. These are the folds that you see here. Same like, same kind of fold. It's on the on this image, it's not very visible, but as soon as you start to move, and that's where your brain comes in, we recognize it much better. The point is that in these images, it doesn't look like that at all. So that's why I think the attenuation of these images are better. Let's see if, it, if the movie wants to run. Especially when it's a little stable, you, re you recognize these folds. Do you see that? And compare that to the left, I think they're invisible, but when you look at the right, you recognize, oh yes, these are the folds that I see in my histology. What is this, like, this big white stuff? Like the... This year? Yeah, that there. This year? Yeah. Oh, that is the air. So the, 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 the catheter is touching the lumen, but sometimes the airway is much bigger than the diameter of our catheter, so there's air around it. So we're basically we're pushing really into the periphery, so the cap is completely enclosed by uh, the long lumen. Then we pull back and then it just creates a bigger lumen. Okay, I, I do recognize these folds. I don't know. What I do. Okay, so then um, what is next? And uh, next is. Uh, oh yeah, this is another example of going from intensity to attenuation. And so this is a this is a cartilage ring. This is I think it's much better recognizable in this attenuation coefficient range. Okay, so let's go now to the to the added value of uh, polarization sensitivity. So we want to extract that airway smooth muscle. Um, 
that I've pointed out earlier. Now we go into this processing. Well, if you do, you need to uh, compensate for polarization mode dispersion. Uh, that's a very difficult problem. Actually, we want to tackle that now by modeling in a computer uh, birefringence, modeling in a computer polarization mode dispersion that happens go through tissue, go through this computer model and see how our current algorithms correct for this effect and if it, if it works well enough and how we can improve. So it's all computer modeling. So that, that's going to happen in the next half year. Um, we have that differential Muller matrix that I talked about, this vector, a uniformity, and then we go to other correction factors and then we end up with these images that I showed you before, right? So we can look at a full pullback, and if it's correct, this one rotates, yes. So if, how do you display the full 3D information? We show you here a cross section and then we rotate the whole thing, and you can see what happens in these areas. Yeah? White is that axis uniformity, so that is where you know there's this um, uh, well thick fibers layer. Can you differentiate between different fibers? Uh, yes. Thanks for asking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so now we can color. Yeah, we can we can color code for the for the actual direction of these fibers. <laughs> and, and... <laughs> and then we do that. We calibrate on the on the uh, on the capital sheet. So the capital sheet is a plastic. And that plastic in the fabrication process also has stress in it, it which creates an optic axis, and we know the direction. So we measure the catheter, we know what the catheter direction is, and we use that to extract the direction of the fibers in the, in the tissue. And so here, uh, zero degrees. So I think this is the one that is now circular. This is the fibers are oriented like this, and uh, green, this color, is along the fiber. And so we can use that where we say, okay, only fiber directions that are more or less circumferential, which are minus 15 degrees, we count this muscle and the rest we ignore. So now we can segment out the muscle layer. And uh, let me see. Oh, first, the movie. Sure, or maybe this purple. Is the uh, one that's oriented around. I think that's. maybe this is over, and yet at that point we have not established yet the color coloring because the uh, the orange is of course way better to to illustrate the smooth muscle versus green. So which one was most? Correct? I think in this one it's the greenish that is oriented like this, but I think in uh, in our latest uh, processing it's uh, uh, this color. It, it much it looks natural it looks much more natural like it's a smooth muscle right you want to make it smooth muscle red uh, and then you can cement out optic axis uniformity and then you can create these segmented images of the uh, of yeah of the airway smooth muscle and then from this you can you can calculate an area so the interesting thing for this one this is the same lumen pre-treatment and post-treatment so we have been back to the exact same branch in the lung and measured before and after and from these images you can't see that very well but this is a graph now of the of these uh, pullbacks so before treatment and after treatment. And then from this graph, you can already see that there is a difference and that post treatment is thinner than before. So the treatment has had an effect. And then the, this is then the final graph. So along this axis, you see uh, we use that as golden standard. So the average amount of airway smooth muscle in the biopsies that were taken from the parietal of these patients. And this one is the average percentage of the uh, airway smooth muscle that we found in our pullbacks and then average over two to four pullbacks and then the, these letters code for different regions so blue 
is pre-treatment. We have only one pre-treatment measure, which is this one here. The red is post-treatment, that's the red balls here. And the green one is the non-treated middle lobe. So you, you have your you have the upper lobes here. In your lung, you have the middle lobe. Middle lobe, you have only on one side, which is on the other side of your heart. And then you have the lower lobes. And then uh, middle lobes are untreated. Uh, the, the values for the middle lobe are actually lower. We measure a lower biofringence versus what's in the biopsies. Uh, so we think that this uh, that the, 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 there is just a lower amount of smooth muscle in the in the uh, in the middle lobe, and that the carina nerves are skewing uh, the amount that we measure in the bias instead of really measuring the human wall. Um, and then uh, these are the, the three points uh, post treatment, and you know we found a very nice correlation. Uh, we, how do we test it? Uh, we test it as the null hypothesis. So you know that it's here is probability, okay, so the significance point zero five. Ah, significant. You know what that means. <laughs> what do you test? Okay. Yeah, but does it mean that it's ah? Uh, I it means that it's your right, it means that uh, you you've got your zero hypothesis. And exactly. You, and what's your zero hypothesis? Um, depends on whatever you were measuring. Well, um, as I, a, um, uh, for this, you mean? Yeah. Zero hypothesis? Well, yeah. I, to be honest, I struggled with the whole concept of zero hypothesis. What does it mean? What do you? What? What? What is your assumption? And the assumption for zero hypothesis is that there is no correlation. So that's a horizontal line. So all you do with no correlation between average ism and, bi and biopsies and yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. So that should be a horizontal line. I uh, yeah, or, or should well, it be an amorphous cloud? I, uh, yeah, I, I feel like I'm misinterpreting the entire draft rules. Uh, what exactly are we looking at? So, so I was thinking, like, ideally, you would want this to be like a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Yeah, the linear line. perfect OCT, right? But it's not perfect. So, well, it's it, it's not perfect. So, our, like the zero hypothesis being just a straight line would imply it's OCT is basically useless, right? It, it just doesn't give any information about the actual yeah, average yeah. and and so you whatever I so the, the, what I and now that we think back about it, what should be that the zero hypothesis is that in this graph uh, I have a completely uniform distribution of points. That any every combination is as like like this one and this one and this one and this one, these measurement points have equal probability. That that would be in my opinion a good. Uh, no hypothesis because it means that there's absolutely no correlation. Well, why would you post that though as a zero? Well, but, but no, but a good question. What would be yours? But would I would be the, the funny thing is it, it doesn't really matter in the end, I guess, because it will get rejected or accepted. Or, or, or I would think you yeah, just go for a linear relationship, basically. Yeah, why do you want no correlation? Because, because no, it is too strange to assume you're, you're testing against a null hypothesis. So, when you say I have a probability of, uh, of 0 0.05 or a significance of 0 0.05, and the significance of 0 0.05 in general is accepted as ah, that's good, right? It's meaningful where you can p value of uh, smaller than 0 0.01. But what does it, what does that mean? It means that there is. Yeah, and few people know this, but what you do is you, you test against the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is how likely is it to measure the null hypothesis that the null hypothesis, hypothesis is true given these measurements. And so what you test against is really important in terms of because if it if these are my measurements. And my null hypothesis is a straight line. 
then yes, it's uh, it, this doesn't look like a straight line uh, or uh, a horizontal line. It looks like a nice. So the, the null hypothesis, the straight line, is very unlikely. And so then this becomes likely, and then you accept it. But you're you are involved in null hypothesis to those of you that have negative correlation. Yeah, right. It, it's a little arbitrary. Yeah. It's just well, it, it is. I think it's important when some. I I didn't realize it when you did this. You test against the null hypothesis. So what you test is how likely is it that the null hypothesis hypothesis is true given your measurement. So what you you test against is really important for the meaning of the significance of the p value. Yeah, if somebody comes up with a really crazy null hypothesis to test again, yeah, it's fine. Wow. The, the thing is, especially in this case, I feel like we throw out one null hypothesis and we just start testing some other, right? Because we're sort of um, trying to find what the correlation is, anyways. But, but all you do with this testing is that. Uh, your, your p value tells you that it's very unlikely that it's a horizontal line. That's, that's all it tells you. Uh, it, here, 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 it doesn't matter where, but the likelihood that it's a horizontal line is uh, at the chance of one in, uh, in this case, uh, uh, one in five million. So p value from uh, 10 to the power of minus seven. Yay. It's a little I'm sidetracking a little bit on the on the but like, uh, detail, but uh, it's 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 really surprising that, that there's a relationship, right? Uh, when you look at this, yes, but uh, you know, uh, and even beforehand, right? Uh, it feels weird like having developed uh, an OCT method and everything, and then being like, well, I'm just going to presume that it doesn't work whatsoever. Well, the, 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 the challenge is to find the scalar applications of the polarization sensitivity. And why is it useful? And this is really the first in vivo measurement that shows that it's good for anything. Well, except for the glaucoma, but that's too many. Yeah, I don't know. That's not working. This is four. Huh? <laughs> and the next thing is what we're doing is looking at this specifically to look at so the amount of fibrosis in there. Reason for that is that uh, you have patients that have interstitial lung disease, but they can't make the right diagnosis. They don't know if they need to prescribe antifibrotic drugs or anti inflammatory drugs. And, and, and one makes it worse and the other one makes it better. So you better have it right. Okay. And so what they do then, they don't know it. So they go to take a biopsy, a surgical biopsy. So basically they operate on the patients, they take out the chunk of the lung. To make the diagnosis. Mortality is like two to four percent. So two to four out of 100 patients die because of this the diagnosis. And and uh, we can we can do that. Uh, where am I? I think I'm done. Oh yeah, these are uh, if they move, they're nice uh, because they might be. No, they don't move. But this is this is like the three D structures that you can generate in the road That's the Great. Okay. Enjoy the rest of your master. Thanks. And uh, maybe I'll see you uh, next year. Yes. Let's see. In the lab. Yeah. Don't you give any other courses? Uh, as in, don't you teach any other? Or were you just like invited by a peer to teach this one? Or? No, I, I, I hear in your app that you teach it in four of Songham or in us. And uh, I do, I also teach the optics course in the, in the Bachelor of uh, Physics. And to become the department head, so I keep and drop in the office teaching and only doing this. Oh, I see. Come to my heart. We put students into the lab. Students. Students, you know, I know.
I also have a colleague who did very well, and we all do very well. Yep, that's it. Um, I'm going to stop sharing.